Welcome back, and thanks for tuning in to episode 70 of Lab Padres SpaceX and Starbase Weekly Updates. It's been a busy week out here at Starbase, so let's dig in. Commencing this week at Starbase, a new platform has been raised and mounted onto the ship Quick Disconnect Arm. This framework will enable workers to access the Quick Disconnect assembly upon its installation. That same evening, an old platform was removed from the umbilical arm as the new hot staging technique made the platform unable to reach the booster ship joint. As Friday night approached, the center segment of SpaceX's new water-cooled steel plate rolled out. After having been worked on inside the Sanchez inventory tent for the past few months, it will hopefully allow for Starship launches with a less destructive outcome. During the last minutes of June, the ship QD plate finally took a stroll out of the build site and was relocated to the launch site. Only small changes to its structure were spotted, including a different pipework arrangement for the new hot staging. Work on the new Mega Bay progressed Saturday morning as the fourth segment of the third level was lifted up and installed on the base, wrapping up the main construction of another floor. This week, my good buddy Mauricio with RGV Aerial Photography took to the Texas skies once again to capture these awesome overhead images, so let's dive right in. Starting off at the Massey's testing site, all three previously unused tanks were finally installed over at the liquid nitrogen storage area. Slightly to the right, the S26.1 test tank is sitting directly on the concrete after having been tested on the can crusher for the last several months. The structural testing cage has undergone further modifications to accommodate a new ship payload bay test article, which was stacked at Starbase last week. Adjacent to the testing cage, the new booster cryostation quick disconnect assembly has been oriented vertically and it has its cryo pipework installed ahead of imminent booster testing. Moving on to the Sanchez site, work on the new ground fabrication building foundation is well underway. Half of the concrete pad is already poured and the rest is being prepared. Columns of the building sit adjacent to that base, confirming the initial relocation speculation. Just to the right, two freshly painted booster grid fins are visible, likely to be installed on the under construction Super Heavy Booster 12. Continuing to the right, all three water deluge manifolds with installation frames are visible. Another ship or booster storage pad seems to be under construction near the air separation unit, just next to the scrapped booster 8 thrust section. Remarkable progress is being made at the Star Factory expansion. About half of the roofing for the initial part of the expansion is already installed, with more staged next to it. Moving towards Highway 4, electrical cabling is laid ahead of the concrete foundation being placed. At the launch site's suborbital side, Ship 25 has all of its engine shielding removed after the six-engine static fire test. Near the orbital tank farm, foundations for several new storage tanks are being prepared with rebar clearly visible. Near the water deluge supply tanks, pieces of gas pipe work are being assembled as the system is slowly taking shape. Finally, at the orbital launch mount, which continues to look better day by day, all of the hold down clamps and Raptor quick disconnects were retracted ahead of the installation of the centerpiece of the water cooled steel plate visible to the north of the launch mount. The newly poured concrete foundation was still incomplete as of this flyover as depicted by visible rebar near the cryogenic pipework in small patches near the orbital launch mount. The ship quick disconnect assembly was lifted and reinstalled atop the arm. Seemingly, it's elevated approximately 2 meters or 6.5 feet higher than before, hinting that the rocket's new hot staging will require only a single ring with cutouts. At the build site, the first segment of the fourth level of the new mega bay was relocated from the assembly area at the Sanchez site to the build site. As Monday began, another orbital launch mount foundation concrete pour started. Over the course of almost 15 hours, a whopping number of over 170 concrete trucks arrived at the launch site one by one. After a long day constantly pouring concrete, the pump trucks departed the launch site as foundation work was wrapping up. Unfortunately, the concrete placement for the launch mount foundation was not fully completed as depicted by aerial images, more on that later. 
On the 4th of July, at the launch site, the LR-11000 crawler crane was busy relocating the water deluge pipework away from the launch tower. On a sunny Wednesday morning, a new door for Ship 28's payload bay was moved into high bay and lifted for installation. Its outer rim is significantly reinforced as captured by Rover 1. As the installation of the centerpiece of the water-cooled steel plate was approaching, its vertical transport stand was moved under the table for a fit test. Interestingly, this relatively heavy structure was moved on top of the recently poured concrete not even days after it was placed. After having been attached to that plate, both the LR-11000 and the GMK-7550 cranes lifted the plate up and maneuvered over the vertical transport stand. That positioning is required as the so-called steel sandwich couldn't be fitted through the OLM legs horizontally. As both cranes were unhooked, the steel plate was carefully moved under the orbital launch mount ahead of the highly anticipated placement. Both cranes were reattached, lifted the steel sandwich up, rotated it while the stand was moved out, and the water-cooled steel plate was installed. This quite complicated process was flawlessly performed by SpaceX's engineers and crane operators, which usually never cease to impress. On a rainy Thursday, the first two manifolds for the steel plate were relocated from the Sanchez site all the way to the launch site. These segments are used to supply high-pressure water into the assembly. Wasting no time, the last and largest manifold also took a stroll to the launch site for installation. Over at Florida on Saturday morning, another Falcon 9 lifted off from SLC-40 with the new European Space Telescope, Euclid, embarking on its adventure to help us better understand the nature of dark matter and dark energy. At Port Canaveral, SpaceX's ship Megan returned from the Gulf of Mexico after supporting an alternative splashdown and recovery location for the CRS-28 mission Cargo Dragon. Later that day, support ship Shannon arrived back at the port with the Dragon capsule after recovering it from the ocean off the coast of Florida on June 30th. On Monday afternoon, Doug returned to Port Canaveral with both fairing halves from the Euclid telescope mission. As sun was rising in the early hours on Wednesday, the drone ship a short fall of Gravitas with Falcon 9 Booster 1080 arrived back at the port after the Euclid telescope mission. A few hours later, Booster 1080 was offloaded from a short fall of Gravitas to the dock ahead of its initial inspections and a later move for refurbishment. As preparations for another Falcon 9 launch were underway, Crosby Skipper towed Just Read the Instructions to the ocean in support of the Starlink G6-5 mission. Later that day, Bob departed the port ahead of fairing recovery from the Starlink G6-5 mission, which is scheduled to launch on July 9th. After being offloaded onto the dock, Booster 1080 was laid down horizontally onto the transporter ahead of a move to Hangar X for refurbishment for another launch. And there you have it, another SpaceX and Starbase weekly update brought to you by Lab Padre. We'll see you next week, and thanks for watching. Lab Padre, out.